Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Today, I'm speaking with Charlie McKenzie, and we have recorded a live strategy audit session for you today. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Charlie, I started Hadley Designs in 2015, and I grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years. I made a lot of mistakes along the way, of course, that made getting that, that path to eight figures take a lot longer than it needed to be. At times, I doubted myself whether I had the ability or if I had a real brand behind myself that I could actually grow to eight figures. I wish I would have had a guide along the way that would have helped me grow faster and avoid a lot of those stumbling blocks that I ran into. If you've hit the same plateau and you want to know the next steps to take in your business, then go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. Email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com with the subject line strategy audit for your chance to win. And don't worry if you don't win the strategy audit this month, you'll be entered to win for future months to come. So send those emails and let me know that you're interested in getting that free strategy audit session. And today I'm excited to introduce you to our first free strategy audit winner, that's Charlie McKenzie. Charlie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me on, Josh. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, Charlie, before we started hitting the record button here, we went through almost an hour long, you know, free strategy audit session where we dove into a lot of stuff that you're working on with your brand. You have a really unique brand and You've actually got more experience than just wanting this running this one brand that we were able to discuss. You've got another brand kind of on the side. You're doing some retail arbitrage as well. So you've got you've uh, got a lot of uh, fishing rods in the water, so to speak. You've got your lines in the water in multiple places. But I think you've got a lot of potential with this brand. So just so everybody knows, uh, his brand is in the the pet supplies industry. All right, and it's a product that that provides a lot of benefit um, to some pet owners. So he's got a lot of potential and especially within the market that he's in, he's got a lot, the people that he serves, you know, they're a loyal fan base. They care about their animals and they want to protect them. They love them. And so I think like you've got an amazing opportunity ahead for you, Charlie, to create a real brand that you'll be able to exit one day um, if you take the right next step. So, at this point with Charlie, Charlie's brand, he's got one SKU. Uh, well, he's got multiple SKUs because he's got some size variations in there. But he's got one product that is generating the sales for this brand. One of the first things that we looked at um, for your brand, Charlie, was keyword research. And you're doing a great job of implementing the right uh, search terms in your product title. In fact, you're crushing you know, the competition in terms of the exact match keywords that you've got implemented in your title. And therefore, you're actually ranked on the first page for many of those keywords. However, you're not in the top five positions, right, on most of those keywords. And so we then went through and discussed, all right, so what are some strategies that we can employ to, you've already got traction, you're obviously indexed for some of these big keywords, how do you move them up into that one to five, you know, uh, organic ranking position? One of the things that we talked about was PPC. And Charlie, you know, you, you've started dipping your toes in the PPC waters. Initially, we talked actually a couple months ago and you were not running ads on Amazon. And, you know, I told you like, hey, you, you should definitely start running some ads on Amazon because it is going to impact your organic ranking You've been dabbling a little bit in that, 
Um, my recommendation to you from our session was that, you know, create some exact match um, keyword campaigns for those keywords that you're trying to rank for, number one. But then number two, one of the things that we've found a lot of success with in our business is product targeting ads on Amazon. And so rather than just throwing it up against, because with your particular product, there's there's other competitors that have different design variations, right? And so rather than just saying, hey, mine's beige, I'm going to go advertise on this pink one or this blue one. You, The customer that's looking for a pink uh, product, they have a specific thought in mind, right? Um, same thing if somebody's looking for blue, like there's a reason why they clicked on the blue listing. So when it comes to setting up your product targeting ad campaigns, one of the things I would definitely recommend is only targeting those competitors that have the exact same color that you have. And you're going to get better performance that way. And what Amazon loves to see is if you can steal sales from those competitor listings, you will shoot ahead of them um, on the organic ranking side. And that will allow you to um, increase your ranking a little bit faster there. In addition to that, we talked about some external marketing that you could be using, and that is Google Ads. I know you've tested this in the past, had about a 200% ACoS there, which isn't great, obviously, but we talked about an additional tactic that you could use that could increase that performance because Amazon is definitely rewarding external traffic, right? Uh, in my prior, one of the prior podcast episodes we had, Tyler Gregg of Amped on the episode, and he shared some fantastic strategies of how to create Google ads and the best way to maximize, um, you know, the return on investment on those. One of the big takeaways from that episode is that rather than just driving traffic to your current Amazon detail page, it's going to be better to create a store landing page for yourself. But in that store landing page, you recreate almost the exact way that your detail page looks on Amazon. And there's a specific section on the store builder page that allows you to basically recreate that detail page. That's exactly what you're going to want to do. And the beauty of driving that traffic to your store landing page that is literally identical to your detail page is that you're able to remove all of your competitors. Because one of the tips, or I guess one of the statistics that Tyler shared on that podcast episode is that 30% of external traffic going to Amazon or from the Google ads ended up being purchases on Amazon. But of that 30%, I would argue to say is probably 5% or less were actually buying the product that they first came in to Amazon looking at. Instead, they got distracted with other competitors or ended up finding something completely different on Amazon that they ended up purchasing. But there's a lot of high search intent or, you know, a lot of people that will convert on Amazon from external traffic. That's proven in the data. But what you need to do is remove as much of that competition as possible. And hopefully that will increase some of some of those conversion rates. Um, Charlie, we also talked about, you know, product images, product copy, and we'll dive into that a little bit further. But I want to hear from your perspective after we went through that strategy audit session, what were some of the big takeaways for you or aha moments, some of the action items that you're going to be implementing? Yeah, well, thanks. That's all great advice. I think one of the biggest things um, that I think that could provide value to me and my scenario with a relatively low SKU count catalog, we're expanding out now, but creating that storefront and running the Google ad specifically to that storefront recreating the detail page and in order to be able to maximize uh, conversion and, and uh, not pay, you know, for a wasted ad spend when people click off of your, your listing is definitely something that I think could, uh, could help. I know Amazon is focusing more on um, valuing external traffic in terms of being able to rank organically. So yeah, definitely um, creating that storefront, even with a low skew count, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to get on that. And then targeting campaigns, haven't had the best of luck with them, but at the same time, they, um, you know, if you're stealing sales from top competitors, as you mentioned, um, Amazon is going to, to be able to reward you and rank you uh, better if you're able to 
to um, to compete on those other competitors' listings. So getting back into the um, product targeting campaigns and uh, as opposed to just exact and auto, um, yeah, I think will really um, be able to help us scale up and uh, as we move and grow our catalog and uh, get more effective at, at PPC. So, yep. Yeah, <laughs> those are some great takeaways. And, I, and as it relates to product targeting, right, is that always the silver bullet? Not necessarily, right? It's always worth testing. But one of the important things is that as you add competitors into your product targeting ad campaigns, one of the things that you can do is like set up your criteria that says, hey, if I get 30 clicks from this competitor and no sales, I'm just going to turn it off. And so with us, we have 1300 SKUs. Like, so we've had to create really strict rules and guidelines. Otherwise, it, you know, it'd just be sifting through the weeds for yeah. us on an ongoing basis. And so create those rules. And guess what? If it doesn't meet the criteria, then you turn it off and you're like, hey, at least it was worth the test. I've done this for all of the competitors. So just have some guidelines whenever you're you're conducting any tests. Charlie, knowing that you have, you know, a low skew count right now, you talked about that you've got other variations that are going to be coming in, that you're going to be setting that up. But we also talked about product innovation, right? Um, and how we don't want to just create kind of like me too products right now. You're at the very early stages of your brand. It's an exciting time, but one of the best ways to build out your brand is launching products on an ongoing basis. Like whether you're a seven figure, eight figure seller, one of the best things you can do to grow your business is keep launching new products, new product, new product, new product, and getting into different, you know, spaces with inside that brand, right? What are some related products? Because as you do that, you know, ideally when you're first starting, you know, start with some of those products that are cheaper and obviously have lower MOQ so that you can just test, test stuff out real quick, see if it works and your risk is a lot lower that way. Now the returns might not be that, that huge, but don't be so determined that you need to have a home run or hit home runs on every single product launch. If you can hit single after single after single after single, like you're going to score some runs here. And that's honestly how we built our business to begin with our first, you know, three or four years, we didn't launch any home run products whatsoever. There were not there. We didn't have any hero ASINs in our business. Rather, we had a lot of products that we launched that were only making like two to three sales a day. Like for most of the audience, they, they, that's kind of laughable numbers, right? They're like, oh, I would never support a product like that. But like, because we were hitting those singles and doubles on occasion, it allowed us to gain more profit, then start investing and getting into some of these much more competitive categories where we have been able to take some home run swings and actually hit some home runs at the same time. So Charlie, going back to kind of that, that product innovation conversation that we had, what were some of the takeaways or aha moments that you got from that? Yeah, well, uh, being introduced to Amazon and kind of coming from an arbitrage background, um, you know, being able to look cross marketplace and understand where the arbitrage opportunities lie on Amazon, you know, itself, because like you said, if you've got a particular niche and group of people that are maybe looking on, um, you know, on, very uh, specific domain websites for very specific styles that they want. You can take a look at those um, those domains and figure out what's working well on those sites, and then look at the arbitrage opportunity and look to see if there's um, the same thing going on on Amazon. If there's not, then you know you uh, have a, a very higher likelihood of success by knowing that um, that there's an opportunity there that's currently selling on another marketplace that you can bring to Amazon and innovate uh, your brand through. So that's definitely um, some great advice. And I, I think Etsy and, uh, and some of the bigger specialized domains, looking at what's working for them uh, will help me take, take my brand to the next level. So, Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I couldn't recommend this more, whether you're listening to this or for you, Charlie, specifically, you know, go to where the majority of your customer audience is hanging out, right? Where do most of them shop now? Again, a lot of customers do shop on Amazon, but what I found is like Amazon's probably one of the last places to get product innovation from, right? Like 
there's actually not a lot of unique, cool ideas that come to Amazon first. Instead, what you find is like you have direct D to C websites, right? Shopify stores or big web, you know, corporate websites that have been around for a while. Those are where, you know, new ideas first come to the market. Same with Etsy, right? That's where new ideas and anything that's like design driven for sure is going to come to the market. And so one of the best ways to to really grow your brand and start dominating in any marketplace, uh, especially on Amazon, is going and finding something that's trending somewhere else and bringing it to Amazon. Um, we have done that with repeated success time and time again. We get really excited when we look at product niches that we're about to get into. One of the biggest like criteria that we use to determine if we're going to go into that product market is do we see a gap in the market from what's trending on Etsy, Pinterest, and you know specific websites? Like if we're looking at going into daily planners, right? Just do a quick do Google search for daily planners, bring up that top website from Google and see like, What's what's the best seller here on this website? And if you see like, wow, nobody has anything like this best seller on Etsy or on Pinterest or here on this other D2C website, you can bring that to Amazon and just start crushing your competition. So definitely recommend taking a look at those um, other websites, getting some inspiration, then continuing to innovate, bring new styles, new designs onto Amazon that people haven't seen. And it's gonna be a lot easier for you to compete um, rather than just on price, right? Um, how, Charlie, how much do you feel like you have to try to like compete on price for your product right now? Um, pricing is definitely something that we're always trying to manage. Um, you know, looking at uh, how your biz ends up being valued at the end of the day and in terms of profit, you know, that's why we've been a little hesitant on the, on the PPC side, but yeah, pricing, um, we are luckily able to, to negotiate, you know, great uh, rates with our supplier. And I think we come in pretty competitive. We're kind of that middle of the road option. So we're not super premium, but we're also not, um, you know, just trying to push a ton of volume being one of the lower price, um, you know, competitors on the platform. So I think, um, you know, making sure that you're, not on either end, super luxury or super cheap. Um, that's kind of our strategy. So I'm interested to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I think one of the first things is that if you don't have a differentiated product, right, one of your only ways to compete is going to be with price alone, right? And so price becomes a huge factor and your business becomes that much more risky in terms of being able to be disrupted by competitors if you're just relying on price alone, right? But if you've got product design or, you know, especially if you're able to get some design patents on your products or even getting a utility patent on your product, that's where the greatest rewards are going to be. That's when you can charge that premium price. And so I think that goes back to that conversation we were having with product innovation, right? That's ideally where you want to be spending the majority of your time. And when it comes into product innovation, you know, one of the other things, not only looking at other marketplaces, which we talk so much about, one of the best things that you can do is go to Reddit or go to Facebook groups, wherever your audience is hanging out and start asking questions about that particular product. Say, hey, when you have this issue and you look for XYZ product, you know, what is it that you feel like is missing in the market? Or, you know, what do you wish these products had but they're missing and as you get to know the customers more number one you'll be able to build your own email list from doing like you know generating surveys and something like that which will allow you to launch quicker and more effectively and actually build a real brand because one of my other episodes we recorded was with kevin king and that is exactly what he talked about he he had mentioned like long gone are the days of you being able to just, you know, launch something out of your garage for 500 bucks. It's a me too product. Doesn't really have a brand behind it. I'm just selling this, you know, let's say Tumblr just for the heck of it, right? And I'm I'm just making some money. Those days are like coming to a close and you've got to build that real brand and that real brand starts to come to fruition 
when you actually have an email list, when you have an audience that you can communicate with outside of Amazon and, and whatnot. So that goes back to that product innovation, right? Yes. Go and identify, communicate with your customers, build an email list, you know, send a survey links into Facebook groups, into Reddit forums, start gathering email addresses and start communicating with customers get some ideas and and maybe they're not even ideas for the specific product that you are selling right now. But if you get into that particular niche in that audience, you can ask them, what are some of the other products that you would like, right? It's maybe not specific to the current product you're selling. That could give you another good indication of like, Hey, here's where I should go next. And when I start launching new products, um, answer the public is another great, great resource. Yeah. They're like kind of like Reddit. That's a, I've, I've, I've done a little bit of research with that. So, yeah. What other research have you done, you know, Charlie for yourself and new product ideas? Um, just, uh, you know, mostly keyword research. I love data dive. Um, I, I would consider that to be my specialty is just, uh, focusing on keyword analytics and understanding how to write the best copy into the best places onto your listing in order to be able to redeem uh, the maximum amount of raking organic ranking juice potential um, out of your listing. So that's why, you know, we've got a relatively, you know, lower review count compared to the top ranked uh, competitors on the first page, but we're able to still somewhat hang with them because of uh, great listing design. And I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's mo- where most of my research has gone. I, I definitely need to, focus on developing the catalog and understanding where there are gaps in the, in the market based on style and functionality and add some, some products um, like that. So get my, my brand store built out as well. And one of the, another thing that you mentioned that I thought was great advice was um, don't focus on being the best version of your competitors, but focus on the root of the, you know, the the root problem that your product solves. So right now uh, I don't think we're doing a good enough job of, um, really reaffirming the purchase intent behind why the original reason why that customer came to Amazon and looks for our product. Uh, We're doing a lot of comparing ourselves based on features to our other competitors, which is something that I, um, you know, really wanted to emphasize that we were better than our competitors. But at the end of the day, um, we need to, to, to emphasize and and reaffirm why the customer is coming to purchase um, our type, our, our type of product to begin with. And so, Implementing that into some of the uh, the image stack, I think, uh, was a, a great great uh, tip that you gave me. So, yeah, yeah, we did. We spent a lot of time talking about product copy, sales copy in his bullets, as well as in the product listing photos, in and of itself. Right now, Charlie, for the most part, your product does well. Your product doesn't have a design patent on it, right? It doesn't have a utility patent on it. And there are other competitors that have a similar style and, you know, similar color of product, correct? So to that extent, you know, you have been focused on like, well, how do I convey that mine's a little bit more durable or a little bit more premium and a little bit better than the competitor? To your credit, you know, go ahead and talk about the bag that you added there because that is a way to differentiate your product. How did you get that idea? Yeah, so um, just customer discovery and understanding kind of the way in which this product is used on a daily basis. Um, we realized that it was being stored a lot of the times in a sticky box and was getting dirty and dusty and, and kind of didn't really have a place. And so we were able to to get a, um, a Cordura waterproof a cinch bag um, you know, with our product for, um, you know, a couple of cents extra landed per unit. So it wasn't that big of a deal. And now we're able to advertise that, you know, uh, in the main image as an accessory that's sold along with our product that no one else does on Amazon. So I think we're seeing some better conversion. We've, we've had some, uh, some, you know, people mention to us, they appreciate that. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, just putting a bag around it has, has, uh, has helped us. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about how do you differentiate yourself? from the competition you've done a good job by adding that bag on your main image because as you scroll through page one nobody else is showing the product with an accessory right nobody you're the first one to be doing that so you're already going to be catching some eyeballs there which is fantastic let's go back to the product sales copy that we were talking about and having that mindset shift of just talking about 
feature, 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 feature of the product and how this is so much better than, than the competitors. Instead, what we found a lot of success with is speaking to the heart of the customer, right? What is it that they are like, why are they hiring? I like to call it like they are hiring this product to solve a problem in their life, right? So you've got to think through what, what are they trying to do? What is their end goal when they get this product? Is it to elevate their, their lifestyle, right? Like if you're getting a Louis Vuitton bag, right? It's like, because I want to show off that either I have money or that I'm somebody of affluence or I, you know, I'm stylish, right? Like the, the status, right? That's a status symbol for them. So that's the way Louis Vuitton communicates to their customer, right? They know the underlying why, the reason why people are purchasing those products is so that they have the status, right? It elevates their status. So a good example of this is like our desk calendars, right? One of the things that people, what we saw in the reviews time and time again, and this is one of the best places that you can go to really understand what is the core need or problem that your product is solving for people is go take a look at those reviews. So what we found is that so many people were saying, because I have this desk calendar now, I no longer miss important events like my son's soccer game. We saw that come up time and time and time again. Now a desk calendar, that's a fairly broad audience. It could be a business professional. It could be, you know, a male. It could be a mom. It could be, you know, anybody. It could be at a doctor's office, right? But what we found is there were a lot of customers that were using it for their personal home life. And so in one of our, the sales copy, we used the phrase, never miss an important event again. Right. And then we had a picture of a kid holding a soccer ball, pointing to the calendar with a big circle around it. Soccer game, 9 a.m. Right. That is now conveying to the customer. Like the reason why they want a desk calendar is because stuff's probably starting to slip through the cracks for them. Right. They want to be a little bit more organized. They want to stop missing events. You know, all of us, as we get busy, it's easy for stuff to slip through the cracks. And that's what we identified as we communicated with customers, as we read their reviews. And so we tweaked our sales copy. We created a product listing image that specifically addresses this benefit, not a product feature, but rather a benefit that the customer is going to receive. And that resolves that core issue or problem that they were experiencing to begin with. And then we added that as our first bullet point. Like the first five, seven words of our entire bullet point are never miss an important date again. Then we go on and yeah, we'll say, hey, this desk calendar is this size and premium paper. It's made in the U.S. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Those product features are, are good. The customers do need to understand that, but hit them in the heart first, right? Get them to be like, ah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I want this, this product to do for me is to resolve X, Y, and Z. Anything else you want to add to that, Charlie, that was a takeaway for you? No, I think that's great. I think that's uh, that's great advice, being able to to speak and, and reaffirm the purchase intent, I think is uh, something that very obvious, but uh, maybe can sometimes get lost in the, uh, the granular details of, of keyword research and out-competing uh, competitors based on features. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. The other thing we talked about briefly was about sales price, right? And testing different sales prices because one of the things that you can do uh, to influence sales is to decrease your price if you want to try to improve that sale through rate or your conversion rate. Um, But you have to do this um, in very isolated tests. We, We talked about this a little bit because you've got to be able to ideally Test this when all other variables can be set aside so that you can conclusively say, like, because I changed the price, X, Y, Z happened. Um, So you've got it. You can't be testing out images. You can't be testing out copy. You can't be sending external traffic to your listing at this time. Like, literally, like, you, you look for a period of two weeks. And in addition to this, you need to make sure that you're doing it 
during a period of the year where, you know, there's not a lot of huge seasonality swings. If you're like coming off like the tail end of your big seasonal period, and then you test another two weeks later and like sales have just dried up. Well, that doesn't mean the test was wrong. It's just like you hit the tail end of the seasonal season. So try to mitigate all of those different variables and then test the price alone. And that's it. Make sure everything else is isolated. And one of the best recommendations, and this was again, one of our other previous podcast episodes was with Roland Frazier. I would definitely highly recommend that you go listen to that podcast episode. He mentioned that when he acquires e-commerce businesses, one of the first things that he does is increases prices. He increases prices and he increases and sometimes doubles the profit overnight and immediately pays for that entire acquisition because many of us, I think, are a little apprehensive to increase our price. But what happens is, you know, if you're the low price leader, right, and you're selling your product at nine ninety nine. Well, it might take you 2,000 sales to generate $500 in profit. Whereas if you sell it at $24.99, then you only need 200 sales to generate $500 in profit. As you are starting, and especially as you're starting to scale your business, and you want to go to eight figures and beyond, cash flow is extremely, extremely important. And if you're that low price leader and you're doing a lot of volume, but making a small margin on there, you're going to run into cash flow issues. You're going to need external financing. Things are going to get more complicated. So for small business owners, one of the most beneficial things I think you can do is test raising your prices on an ongoing basis. And and get you have to get to know what that price elasticity is so that you genuinely know, hey, $24.99, is where I make the most profit. Because as soon as I go to twenty five ninety nine, guess what happens? My sales go down and yeah, I'm making more profit, more than, you know, I'm charging more, but there was that much of a difference in the number of units that I was selling that it it offset, you know, the increase in revenue that was being brought in. So I had to go back to twenty four ninety nine because that's the sweet spot, right? Where I'm maximizing the profit. So there's a lot of different business strategies out there, but as you build out a brand, that's one of the biggest recommendations I would give you so you don't run into cash flow issues. Any other thoughts you wanted to share with that, Charlie? Totally, yeah. For instance, we um, were testing out a price of 1846 in Central Texas. You know, after that was the highest price that we could charge to get a true cost of under $20 uh, when you factor in sales tax. And you can use a site like salestaxhandbook.com and um, look at, you know, where a lot of your sales are coming from in particular states and take the average, you know, total sales tax rate and then apply that to your prices. But at the same time, lowering our price to that 1846 value might have not been worth it in terms of the total number of sales of extra sales we were able to generate from that decrease in price versus the, you know, the loss in margin. So, um, you know, like you're saying, it's uh we're all apprehensive to increase prices, but um, with the with inflation and and shipping only going getting more expensive, it's that's a that's one thing that you do have uh, control over that's very easily uh, manipulated and can be tested. So, yep, to- totally agree, Charlie. I, we're gonna talk about you know your favorite software tools, some of the cool hacks that you've implemented into your own business, but any other takeaways that you had from our strategy audit session that you want to share with the audience? Um, just making sure to reaffirm purchase intent. Um, really, uh, you know, make sure that you're, you're going to, I see, I pulled reviews from the top 10 competitors in our niche, but I think I'm going to go back and pull maybe the top 100 reviews now, and then um, really do a deep dive and make sure that we're understanding pain points and using that combined with some, uh, you know, research from Etsy there's a program called Allura. I believe they can get you some estimated sales data on, on Etsy. I looked into that. Um, and combining pain points with opportunities um, across other marketplaces such as Etsy will be where I'm going to go to first in order to uh, to hopefully grow my brand out, set us apart, and, um, and make sure that we uh, can start to develop some goodwill behind our name. I love it. I love it. 
Well, Charlie, would you say that the strategy audit session was at least worth your time and beneficial? Absolutely. A hundred percent worth worth it all the way. I, I should have been paying Josh many, many dollars per hour for this, but so I'm, I'm thankful to be here. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Hey, so one of the, I've got three questions that I want to ask you before we leave. And uh, one of those questions is what is one book that you've read that's been influential in your life and uh, that you would recommend to other people? So this book is not necessarily e-commerce focused. It's not necessarily necessarily uh, entrepreneur related, but um, it's a lady uh, called Yanomi Park. And she actually first heard of her from an uh, interview, a podcast interview with Joe Rogan. And um, I ended up reading her book after that. It's called In Order to Live. And she escaped from North Korea. And I think a lot of times whenever, uh, you know, us entrepreneurs, single solo owner operators like I am, get a little overwhelmed with decisions and we're having to make so many decisions on a daily basis, you feel like things are caving in and, and then you lose, you lose sight of really how, how good we have it here and how many things you really have to be thankful for. And I think I always remember when I'm feeling stressed out or, you know, there's so much going on. I remember that book. I remember her story and um, her story is incredible. It, it really makes you uh, put things into perspective and realize that uh, our problems are very small here. And uh, and and uh, it, it, it's a motivating factor for me to be able to to put put some stressors aside and, and realize I've got it pretty good. So, yeah. And, and that's an important takeaway, I think, for anybody that that road. Um, an entrepreneurship journey can be lonely at times and can feel like, you know, you know, some of the worst times in life you you could be going through. But putting it into context, I think that's great because as entrepreneurs, we need to continue to persevere. So I'm going to have to go check out that book. I've never read that book and haven't heard of it. So thank you for recommending it, Charlie. I think that will sure. be super helpful. No um, problem. Another question I want to ask you here is your um, recommended software, like what is one of the best software productivity tools you've implemented in your business and why? Yes. Yeah, so I think it's really important to understand PPC on a manual level and how um, your ad spend uh, makes an impact on your total organic sales that you're able to drive to your, to your listing. Um, I have uh, been using scale insights, um, but then a way that I like to track organic versus paid sales and the ratio between those two that I think is a little bit better than scale insights um, is called seller board. And um, I'm sure many of you have, have seen it, but it's uh it's just a, it's a pretty cheap and uh, just analytics platform and it pulls data really well from, from Amazon and is able to, to let you quickly diagnose where your ad dollars are being spent the most effectively and how to drive as many organic sales to, to your you know, specific ASINs as possible. So, I would say that and then data dive, um, you know, being able to implement keywords into the correct parts of your listing to redeem as much ranking juice credit. Um, like I said, that's uh, worked very well for me and, um, and Brandon Young over there, them, you know, they've developed that tool quickly and I only see it to continue to, to add tremendous value to my business and my situation. So, yeah, yeah, we are, we are big fans of data dive as well. So definitely recommend Brandon Young. He, he's a future podcast guest interviewee. Um, and so I look forward to, you know, having him here and dropping knowledge bombs on data dive. That is one of the most amazing um, software tools. So happy to hear you're, you're having success with that, Charlie, like we are. Um, final question. What, who are some of like the most influential people in the e-commerce Amazon space that you like to follow and listen to and why? Yeah, so I mean, um, definitely going to be listening to this podcast more and more. Um, Brandon and uh, and the Inner Circle and Seller Systems, I, I really respect. I, I've learned a ton from them. I went to my first Amazon event in Austin um, and met you. Um, and so, you know, groups like that and, uh, you know, the Inner Circle and Brandon Young. And, and then also I started, I, I don't have a, uh, I'm 23, so still pretty early on in on my journey, but um, I've got already friend, crushing it early on in life. <laughs> I've got a, a friend named Nathan and, and he and I have developed some software tools to uh, help us consistently find some more profitable arbitrage deals. So um, yeah, just, just staying in tune, still looking to learn, still have a lot to learn. Um, and uh, Brandon and, and Nathan, and then, and then you as well, all meeting all of these crazy, crazy Amazon people. And uh, you guys have been tremendous uh, 
added tremendous value to my business already. So awesome. Well, that's great. Is Nathan somebody that other people would know, or is he just a personal contact you have? Just, a, just, a, just another guy, just another seller, just like I am. I, I'm just a seller, so don't, don't have anything to sell you, or haven't, haven't worked in the Amazon space. Actually, I lied. I, I'm going to do some consulting for a smaller uh, firm. Works with some brands here within the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, start that up. So, but, awesome. but I'm just a normal seller at the end of the day. So, <laughs> awesome. I love that, Charlie. That's fantastic. You're not just a nor an ordinary seller. You're doing some amazing things, and and you've shared some amazing tips uh, yourself and things that you were working on. So actionable strategies, I think that any seller can kind of walk away from this conversation with is number one, product innovation is key. One of the things that you need to continually be focused on if you have an e-com brand and you're selling on Amazon and other marketplaces is continuously launching new products because the shelf life of certain products, you know, I think gets shorter and shorter as more and more competition um, comes on board. And so being able to stay ahead of that by consistently launching new products and not just launching me too products. We had a great conversation today talking about how do you differentiate your product? How do you go find what's trending on other platforms and bring it onto Amazon? And that's really where you'll find a lot of success. Number two, we talked about um, your sales. And in your sales copy on Amazon, under, understanding the customer why. What are they hiring this product to do for them in their life? Um, identify that problem and then state how that product is going to be the solution. We use the example of never miss an important date again for desk calendars. So implementing that into your listing images and immediately on in your bullets, it will help increase the conversions as well. And then finally, we talked about price testing and maximizing your price for profit, not just for, you know, the highest conversion rate, not just for um, the sales velocity per se. You want to make sure that you are generating the most profit at your price point. And so for anybody that wants to increase your profit, go and increase your prices, start testing it out. Even if you sell fewer units, you might actually be making more money. So run the numbers run those tests and isolate those variables. Charlie, is there anything else you think we covered that we haven't talked about that you wanted to share? Um, I think we hit, hit on a lot of, you know, very, uh, you know, good touch points that I can make actionable changes to and, and see the results of those. I think, uh, some vine specific SKUs, um, we mentioned this before, but we've been able to, uh, really um, increase our average star count from Vine reviews upon a launch by creating some Vine specific SKUs and then adding some handwritten notes. Um, you can use a service like RoboQuill or Simply Noted to be able to, um, you know, maybe push that four star rating would have been a four star rating, but, but then they decide to go to a five star, tell them how much you appreciate their contributions to the Vine program um, by creating some Vine specific SKU um, and then uh, adding some handwritten notes and just giving it a, a personal touch to uh, to hopefully kind of uh, maybe be able to swing their opinion a little bit. Sometimes those Vine reviewers can be pickier than than average, so or we know they are. So uh, that's something that's helped me. Yeah, I think that I'm I'm glad you shared that because I think those are also three really cool software recommendations as well in terms of you know facilitating handwritten notes and the cool way that you're implementing that using Vine, and I think I want to clarify this with the audience, what Charlie's talking about is creating a SKU that is specific for Vine, because when they take images of the product, right, there's going to be like a handwritten note and maybe better packaging and all of that stuff. That's all good because you want to impress those Vine reviewers, but then when you launch your other product or your the same product on Amazon, but you're not going to have handwritten notes included in every package, that's going to come with a new SKU, but then you're going to merge those ASINs together. Correct, Charlie? Yep. Yep. All for the reviews. Yep. Perfect. Well, I think you've dropped some good knowledge bombs on us, Charlie, as well. Hopefully this was helpful for yourself and for the audience. Thanks again for joining us. All right. Thank you very much. I uh, wish you best of luck with the, with the podcast. So it's very helpful. Thanks, Charlie. 
Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.